All right. Well, welcome everyone to SciLab seminar. I am excited to introduce uh, Juan Andre uh, Guerrero today. He is a cybersecurity researcher at Kaspersky Lab, a part of the research and analysis team there. Before joining Kaspersky Lab, he was the um, a senior cybersecurity and national security advisor to the president of Ecuador. Uh, his today's talk is titled Cyber Spies, Counter Spies, and the Missing Validators. So, uh, welcome to Mr. Guerrero. Welcome to Pittsburgh. Thank you, Alex. Hello, guys. Can everybody hear me? I'm hoping. Yeah? All right. Um, so, my name is Juan Andre Guerrero Saade. As Alex said, I'm part of the global research and analysis team at Kaspersky. Uh, I don't know how many of you are actually familiar with the great team. If any show of hands, I know everybody's having lunch, and I, I hope I don't ruin your lunch. So I'm going to try to be as, as nice about this one as possible. Uh, give me a sense of the crowd. Are you guys into threat intelligence? Anybody know, follow anything to do with cyber espionage or malware analysis? I see a couple of hands. All right. So I want this to be accessible to everyone. So if at any point I just like fly off the handle, feel free to shout, raise your hand, ask a question. Don't worry about it. If I start using acronyms you're unfamiliar with, you can call me out on that. That's fine. Uh, the whole point is for us to have a understandable conversation about this and not for me to rant on my own for about an hour. So we're going to have a bit of a complicated discussion today. Um, and the reason I say that is uh, this is all born of a paper that I, I published a couple of years ago and that I only spoke of once and I never talked about it again because I became aware of the fact that I was trying to reach a problem, to discuss a problem of validation that was arising in the threat intel industry. And the way that I, want, that, that I went about discussing that was so complicated that I think it was really inaccessible in a lot of ways and it kind of suggested that the industry wasn't really ready to have that kind of a meta discussion about where it was going. So now that we're two years out uh, from when that was originally published, I feel that we might be able to have a more mature conversation about what's happening there and what the role of academia um, and some of the you know, sort of diverse sectors can be in threat intelligence, which usually don't get tapped into. So this is a bit of outreach on my part, uh, and I, I hope you know, it goes well. So since not everybody's into threat intel, we can you know, do kind of a brief introduction. So this is what I tend to characterize threat intel as. It is a nascent practice. It has only been around uh, in, in its current form since about, um, let's say, 2009, 2010, following a period that I call the APT uh, embarrassment of riches period, which is there was a period uh, in everybody who did malware analysis was essentially tracking cybercrime. This is, of course, outside of the NSA and, and some of the more uh, classified environments that we usually don't get any access to. So as far as the public sector was, conf uh, was concerned, as, as, as far as uh, public industry was, was concerned, uh, nobody thought of cyber espionage as a possibility or an actuality or something that we were going to get into anytime soon. So there was a sort of tinfoil hat contingent and they didn't really accept um, the notion that we were going to be discussing this quite so soon. And then, you know, Stuxnet, Dooku, Flame, Drop, uh, within the same period of about 18 months and everybody's perception of what could and should be happening all of a sudden changes very drastically. Uh, we all got drag kicking and screaming into a very different scenario. So it wasn't malware analysis anymore, it wasn't uh, dealing with cybercrime anymore, it was investigating cyber espionage. And we were still the same people, we still had the same skills, and nobody had prepared a conceptual framework for us to get into this. So what you get is essentially about seven or eight years where we're all fumbling to find our car keys and figure out what industry we're in now and what it is that we're doing and what it is we're producing and why and how. So it's important to distinguish that we're not doing IT and we're not doing IR. We're not doing incident response. It's not the same thing. Essentially what Threat Intel is doing is creating a context and it is an important context because it's, it's, it's telling the story of what the apex predators uh, in cyberspace are doing at any given time and how they go about their campaigns and what their tools are and what they discover and where they mess up and how they do it. 
and essentially creating this narrative of what these different threat actors are up to that allow us to disambiguate further attacks and campaigns when they start getting a little more cunning. So there are cases of manipulation and attempts to confuse researchers, and that's a whole different conversation we can get into. Uh, but essentially, Threat Intel will provide the context for you to be able uh, to know when you're being tricked, hopefully. Uh, but more importantly, to say, okay, I'm managing a, a company in a certain vertical that is usually targeted by, I don't know, Chinese threats or targeted by anybody that cares about uh, the hotel industry. Uh, who are the threat actors that care about this usually and how do they go about doing that and what can I watch out for? I mean, even Fortune 100 companies with tons of resources only have so much budget for incident response, only have so much budget for protection, uh, and the idea that they're going to protect against everything is unrealistic to the extreme. So it is also a way to essentially harness resources. There's a need for that to be global, which is not necessarily uh, a simple thing to swallow for a lot of companies. You don't necessarily... Um, a lot of companies don't want to do threat intelligence when it's against their host country. You know, nobody wants to be the American company researching American threats, uh, but that gets hairy in a way that we can discuss afterwards in, in the Q&A, especially given the leak of uh, tools where you don't necessarily control what your toolkit is going to be able to do in the future. Uh, and I do believe that threat intelligence protects the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, we're actually in the top you know, 100 for MSRC for reporting zero-day exploits in the past year. Uh, we don't develop exploits. We're not vulnerability assessment people. It's just that because we track some of the most well-resourced threat actors on the Internet, uh, we tend to be the first ones to notice when they start dropping new zero-days and we report them to Microsoft. So that's a very real uh, measure of protection that even private company threat intel teams provide for the entirety of the ecosystem that isn't necessarily paying for it. So it's something to keep in mind. It's a kind of short introduction. For those of you that are unfamiliar with GREAT, and probably for those of you that are still familiar with GREAT, this is more or less an incomplete tree of some of the APT operations and threat actors that we've been tracking up to 2015. And I know that it's probably hard to read, so you know we can start with Stuxnet and Dooku, go into Gauss, Flame, Mini Flame in 2012. Then you get into things like Team Spy and Red October and WinNTI and a lot of sort of very interesting actors like Regan and Careto, which I imagine some of you have heard of, Turla, getting into Equation and, and so on, Sophocy. That's 2015. So what happens in 2015? First of all, notice the trend. There's a lot more uh, as we go year by year. That's not to say that there are a lot more uh, cyber espionage operations happening. It's not to say that there are uh, that pe it starts becoming popular and more people join the space. It's actually about us getting better as an industry at catching these things. Most of the threat actors, even at the very end of that tree, were active way before this, before, you know, around the time of Stuxnet or before. And you end up unearthing entire operations you'd never heard of in 2016 that have been going on for 8, 10, or if any of you saw the Moonlight Maze report, 20 years. So if anybody did see that, I'd love to talk afterwards. So. I get a little bit insulted because people say, well, you know, what happened to GREAT? You guys stopped doing research in 2015. You stopped publishing anything. And that's not true at all. Uh, but we did stop publishing almost all of our research into APTs. So I'm sorry for those of you that rely on, you know, public uh, disclosures. But, you know, if you do look at the back end, you've got a whole lot of very interesting reports that are getting pushed out to book. I don't know what the hell happened with the clicker, but that was not what I intended. Anyways, that are getting pushed out to a whole lot of, um, of customers and people that are subscribed to our private service, if you don't mind me backtracking here very quickly. Um, and uh, they include a whole host of new threat actors and new techniques and new findings that don't necessarily make the light of day and may not ever get put out there. And that's something to keep in mind. A lot of the research, this is us transitioning. There's a lot of companies that never were public in the first place. There's a lot of research teams that didn't have an interest in, in, in making their brand per se, because there are actual market incentives involved in whether you are publishing your research or not, and then whether you stop publishing it or not, as you might expect. So there's a lot of research that's happening behind closed doors. And I think as academics, uh, and if there are any sort of historians here, which there may or may not be, I get surprised every once in a while, uh, this should be very worrisome. There's a lot that's happening that's never going to see the light of day. So, what changed? Like I said, we went from tracking cybercrime to 
tracking cyber espionage, and we were no more prepared to do that than you might expect. It was still just a bunch of geeks, malware analysts, people that you know really enjoyed sitting in front of their computers having hard problems to solve, but the nature of the products themselves changed. All of a sudden we were looking at what was still malware, but it was doing different things, coming from different places, targeting different people, and we had to adapt our concepts on the fly and, and essentially try to understand what it was that we were doing. And I think that the structure of it actually, um, what w the structure that we came up with was a, an essentially flawed one, but also one that you would expect of being in the private sector and having to justify what you were doing. So one of the reasons, one of the failures that has gotten us into such a contentious situation with governments and, and the private sector and the public sector and so on, and essentially in a place to spit in everybody's face, to piss everybody off, um, as threat intel researchers, is the fact that we fail to understand that cyber espionage is part of espionage proper. If somebody here decided that they were going to start a company that just tracked CIA agents abroad all day and publicized their operations, I can assure you, well, I'm not going to say that they would, the CIA in particular would do something terrible to you, but I assure you that you were going to have some problems. You're going to have, whether it is market problems, reputational issues, and so on. And maybe it's not the CIA, maybe it's the MSS, or maybe it's the FSB, or whomever, but you're going to piss somebody off. Uh, and that's essentially what the threat intel industry is. Sometimes it's cyber criminals, sometimes it's mercenaries, sometimes it's people that don't have a mandate to be doing what they're doing, sometimes it's people doing things that, at least by the standards of their own countries, are legitimate. So, and you don't necessarily ever know that going into it. That's something we're going to discuss. The other thing is, is if we're producing threat intelligence and we accept the idea that threat intelligence uh, research teams produce threat intelligence and sell it, then I don't think it should be outlandish to say that we're intelligence brokers. However, if you ask anybody who works in threat intel whether they are intelligence brokers, they, they'll at least fumble, but chances are they're not going to be willing to accept that term. So we haven't been able to essentially embody the role that we've landed into because we're unwilling to say so. Um, and why should we discuss any of these issues in these terms, uh, terms of intelligence brokerage, terms of, of intelligence production cycles and so on, uh, it's because I think that there's a problem with the structure of the industry that's causing all of these contentions uh, and it's causing market reactions that are then going to put us into even bigger issues that I hope that we can come uh, just an inch closer to solving today. So uh, this is a big lead up because thankfully I've gotten an hour, I got 20 minutes to talk about this the last time, it did not. Uh, in any way uh, start to breach the surface of the issue. There's a paper, for those of you that like to read really boring things, there's a paper that I you know, released about two years ago and you're more than welcome to read and we can discuss, but I, I'd like to kind of uh, focus this more on you guys and what we could be doing together going forward. So first and foremost, let's discuss the operational methodology of the threat intel industry in comparison to the conventional or traditional um, intelligence sector. So intelligence is something that, you know, it's the second oldest profession as some may have said, but it, as far as modern versions of, of, of intelligence agencies go, they do have a production cycle. They don't just sit around reading uh, whatever they want and writing whatever they want. You usually have uh, a way of delimiting your intelligence requirements and producing them in a way that hopefully has some rigor to it and you're not going to be producing fluff. So uh, one way to kind of synthesize that is to say you're going to have a request. Somebody's going to, you know, one of your intelligence consumers is going to come and say, hey, we need to know what's happening with this thing. Uh, you're going to go gather information, whether it is open source, closed source, from, you know, covert sources, from infiltrations, from signals intelligence, from human intelligence, from whatever. You're going to gather as much information that you can. You're going to put it in the hands of what are hopefully qualified analysts, most likely with a very diverse set of skills. Um, you know, if you think about what it's got to be like to work in the analysis section of a very legitimate, uh, very cool place like the CIA, you are not just going to have people that are in intelligence, you're going to have people that know about um, nuclear weaponry and nuclear physics, and you're going to have people who are electrical engineers, and you're going to have people who are political science majors, and you're going to have people that are specializing just in certain regions like Latin America and Vietnam and so on. You need to have just as much uh, diversity of research skill to be able to understand and coalesce these things at an expert level. 
Uh, and sometimes it gets outsourced to certain universities, as some of you may be familiar with. But the idea is you have to be able to coalesce this product, uh, not just at an expert level, but to answer your original request. And then you can strategize and say, okay, this is the full weight of what we know about this thing. However, what will benefit the decision makers that we're supposed to be serving? How much of this do we provide them with? How much of this do we not provide them with? At some point you have to say, hey, if the consumer is in a position to put themselves in an antagonistic situation based on what we give them, maybe we need to be able to curtail that a little bit. Or maybe we need to present our case in a certain way. Not to be Machiavellian about it, but simply to say, you know, uh, you need to be able to couch it in the right context to land this properly and not start wars or, or create conflicts where you don't need to. And then, of course, you deliver your product directly to the customer and maybe to allied intelligence services or to allied uh, institutions that might benefit from it as well. So the, the whole idea is we're producing actionable intelligence, we're giving it to people in an information asymmetrical space that can do something with that intelligence. That's what it's for. That's the nature of intelligence. So how did Threat Intel go about this? Not like that at all. Like we sort of cobbled together this production process um, that well, it's in the nature of what we're studying that it isn't the same, but also most of the people involved in this were not intelligence analysts. They did not come from Langley or, or, or the Fort or any of these other places. Some of them did, but a lot of them didn't. Um, and what ended up happening is we didn't really adapt our production process all that efficiently or all that well. First of all, there's no delimiting request. There's no one in particular that is asking you. Unless you're doing an incident response engagement, chances are you don't have a specific case that you're addressing by investigating what you're investigating. Maybe you just ran into some interesting samples. Maybe you just ran into something on virus total and you're, you know, you're pulling that thread and you're saying, I want to know what this thing is. But there's nobody who's sitting at the other side waiting and saying, you know, I need that information for this specific purpose. You're just digging. So there's no request to essentially shape the nature of your investigation. Um, by the time that you're gathering information, like gathering samples, indicators, or, or uh, mapping command and control infrastructure, servers, and so on, you've already traipsed into the operation. You're not just an outside observer that's trying to collect whatever information. Just by the very nature of starting to gather information, you've essentially already tripped uh, into what may very well be a covert operation or something that you really shouldn't have meddled with. Um, at the same time, there isn't a diversity of analysts and resources involved in most of these companies. It's, it's part of the nature of the private sector that you tend to define yourself in a very myopic way. We say, hey, uh, we're an anti-malware company, we're a programming company, so on, and we only hire engineers. So then all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation where you need to do political analysis or international relations, and uh, you still just have the same five geeks who discovered this thing and understand it better. Um, and they're the ones who are going to do the analysis. And, and that's how you end up getting a whole lot of oversimplifications. Like, this is the way North Korea acts. This is what the Iranians do. It's a whole country. Not only is it a whole country, it's a whole country involved in a series of conflicts with a series of different institutions vying for budgets, vying for political uh, influence that may be involved in different political parties, different religious conflicts, and so on. The diversity of issues that should go into that analysis uh, is stunning. But most of the time, we just kind of flip right over it and just say, you know, this is how Iran acts. And, and decisions are made on the basis of that. Analyses are published with that kind of oversimplification, which I shouldn't have to tell you is ridiculous. And beyond that, we, we commit the cardinal sin as far as intelligence goes, which is once you produce all of this, we don't really strategize what we're going to do with it. That is um, essentially deferred to PR and sales and marketing teams. And for them, their metrics are just numerical. How many targets did we hit? How many people did we get to talk to? How good is our reputation on the basis of having uh, put this out there as far and wide in circulation as we can? And for intelligence, that's a horrendous thing because what you're saying is not only did we catch intelligence agency A, B, or C in this place where it shouldn't have been, uh, we then let everybody know about it. So not only have you failed, we're publicizing your failure, we're publicizing your operation, and we're doing that to the tune of, I don't know, a $2 million marketing budget uh, and banners and you know, announcements and so on. It gets pretty ridiculous. So in, in every possible way, uh, we violated a series of, of intelligence production rules. We have not necessarily produced a rigorous product. 
uh, nor does it necessarily have a, a, a clear purpose. It's not necessarily being produced to be actionable. It's not necessarily being produced to be good for the people that may receive it. It's not necessarily being produced for anyone in particular. So we've got a series of problems involved in that, but that is essentially the intelligence production process. And you get into issues in Threat Intel uh, that are very clear to see. This is, I've, I've hammered on these guys, and I really shouldn't because it's not like you know, Threat Connect is a bad company or anything of the sort, uh, but this is such a good example of, of a, I think, everything that goes wrong in the intelligence production process. There's a report called the Camera Shy Report. Um, I don't know if any of you might have seen it. No? All right. I think, all right, one hand. Um, so the camera shot report was interesting. It, it, the idea was Threat Connect um, was tracking this presumably Chinese uh, PLA unit uh, doing cyber espionage operations against Vietnam and other countries in the region. And uh, they figured out that one of the guys was reusing his handle, his username, and they were able to identify who it was. And it's a, like a 40-page report about this guy modeling who he is, where he is, what he sells online, why he does it, you know, what his bike path is, and all these things. And it, it, they got into some hot water. People got a little upset because they even put pictures of him with, like, his newborn son and, like, all these things. Were... The issue is beyond the schadenfreude of, of getting to say, hey, you know, you screwed up and we know who you are beyond the legitimacy of what operations might, you know, the Chinese might be doing, whether you agree with them or not, I mean, I, I think if it would be very simple thought exercise to say if this were a Booz Allen Hamilton contractor, I think we'd all have some very serious problems with this. Uh, but beyond that, I challenge any of you to look at that report and find the actionable intelligence value of it. 40 pages on the life of one guy who committed a mistake in the middle of an APT operation, but nothing that a company that may be on the receiving end or an institution that may be on the receiving end of these hacking operations can do with that report to make their situation better. So I think it's one of those points at which um, maybe it's a public interest, maybe it's a general interest, but I wouldn't call this threat intelligence. And it's not just on this company in particular, it's something that we all get into a little bit to, to you know, kind of show off that somebody made a mistake, but we don't remember what it is we're supposed to be doing with this. So the paper that I published at the time was called The Ethics and Perils of APT Research, and I wish I hadn't called it that, but essentially it forced me to have to discuss ethics and perils of APT research. So I wanted to get into that for a little bit, uh, just to kind of understand why it becomes so problematic for individuals, for companies, um, and what the nature of some of the issues are. Uh, depending on where you're operating, you're subject as an individual, as an individual researcher, whether you're you know, an individual researcher, independent researcher, or as part of a company, you do start getting into certain issues like you know, subtle pressure, patriotic enlistments, people saying, you know, hey, you're a good you know, American, you probably shouldn't be doing this thing, or you're a good Russian, you're a so on, you probably shouldn't uh, be messing with this sort of thing, but also bribery and blackmail and legal repercussions and threat to your livelihood, like, you know, the simplest one is, hey, you depend on your security clearance to do this kind of work. You're not going to be clearable from this point forward if you continue to publish or you continue to operate or you continue to communicate or you continue to so on. Actually, we're having a big issue with security clearances in this country where most of the very qualified people who could be doing this kind of work and should be doing this kind of work, if they're not in the fort or they're not in one of these uh, particular agencies, they're essentially barred from doing a whole lot of work that would be very useful right now. Uh, in, that, in line with that, and not in, with absolutely zero judgments on, on the NSA or any of the other institutions here in the U.S., but if you can think of the amount of tools that are getting leaked right now and, and are not being analyzed by a lot of the people that have clearances and technically can't look at them, uh, it, it sort of places you in an, an interesting dilemma where you go, okay, these are now publicly traded tools that are an issue for a lot of companies, including companies stateside, individuals, and so on, that anybody with a security clearance is not legitimately capable of looking at. So it's something to consider. Uh, I don't really like to consider the more ridiculous things like elimination, and people like, like to hype up the intelligence, covert, James Bond nature of things, and I don't think that that's what we need to worry about. I think we have more practical issues to discuss. So I think that comes up when you start talking about companies. Similar to the whole idea of, of you know, messing with clearances, which is not just an issue in the U.S. It's an issue in, in, in most, uh, you know, first world countries where you might be trying to do this kind of work. 
Uh, a similar issue happens with uh, government partnerships or contracts, public sector contracts, contracts with big defense contractors. Anybody that depends uh, on these sorts of contracts for their livelihood and any company that depends on this for their main sources of income is most likely going to have a very big issue with their threat intel team very quickly. So it's something to keep in mind. This isn't a political research. It very quickly, even when in the best of intentions with the most rigor and the most sort of uh, academically valid attempts to, to put you know, one foot in front of the other, you're going to get into issues by the very nature of what you're researching. So again, it starts to create problems for your company. If you don't have an alternate revenue stream, like if you're an ISP, uh, an internet service provider, and you make all your money on the basis of you know, providing internet to people and homes and companies, and you decide to start a threat intel team, if they get you into hot water, you can say, hey, stop publishing. But it's still in the nature of what we do that we should probably get some threat intel. We've got good visibility. Just shut up and do your work. And that's fine. But if you start a company saying, hey, we're a threat intel startup, we're going to disrupt the threat intel game or whatever, and tomorrow somebody goes, you know what, like, we're your main buyer, we can't buy from you anymore because what you're doing is causing us issues, that company's done. It's something to keep in mind. Uh, again, market pressures. And then uh, let me not let myself off the hook and other threat intel researchers off the hook. There are ethical dilemmas that come up for sure. You have to admit that there are ethical issues, that there are ethical imperatives and requirements that might make a cyber espionage operation a seemingly legitimate thing. I mean, the issue that always gets brought up is pedophilia, uh, you know, and sex trafficking, uh, but also terrorism. I mean, what better way to keep track of, of terrorists and terrorist cells and lone wolves and so on than to be able to infect them individually? You're not talking about, you know, doing a dragnet on the entirety of the United States or the entirety of the world. If you can just target people that, I don't know, go to uh, radical forums and infect only their machines and know what they're looking into, I think most people wouldn't necessarily have an issue with that. The problem is, from the perspective of threat intel researchers, we don't get many choices. So if there is no malware diversification, then if the same suite of malware, let's say Regan, is used for, um, to track you know, a cell of terrorists, and at the same time it's used to infect Belgacom, or a perfectly legitimate ISP, or academic researchers in a university, or uh, you know, politicians in a Western developed nation, it isn't a simple case of, hey, you know, there's some terrorists involved in here, we're not going to detect this thing. You have ethical imperatives on both sides to do what you're supposed to do as a defense company and protect your users. There's also an inability to discern intention behind tasking, and that's something that I think needs to be discussed, especially in the age of the intercept and other, like, radical pro-privacy groups, which I, you know, I can sympathize with, but let's be perfectly honest, there are people that abuse covers in order to do nefarious things. There are people who pretend they're journalists when in reality they're facilitating terrorism. There are people who uh, pretend that they're businessmen when it, or you know, business women, business people, when in reality they're facilitating funds for things that none of us would agree with. We as researchers are not in a point of visibility to discern the intention behind the tasking in an operation. It's in the nature of intelligence agencies to be a societal response to duplicity. And we're not in a position to necessarily second guess that. That doesn't mean we give them a pass, but we have to admit that we, there are things we cannot know and there are, there are things that we are putting our hands in and changing, the tip, you know, tipping the scales without having full information. We can't have full information about. So then, you know, if, if, if you decide to be a little bit more mature about your threat intelligence production, you start to get into what I like to call the strategic calculus. You're going to do this bit of dancing around and say, hey, what is actionable? What can we provide people that they need? Uh, what can we provide companies that are going to allow them to defend themselves and so on? Who is it, you know, who is it for? Um, and then when you do ask who is it for, can we provide it directly to that person? You, you can get into a different discussion, which is the sort of notion of agential regency, this, this idea that you can say, hey, I know to a certain extent what this customer, this company is capable of doing with this information. How much of it do I need to give them or should I give them or is it advisable to put our company name on and give them? 
if you're providing something to GE or, or to a random company that's you know, being targeted by a certain nation state sponsored group, sure, it's satisfying to go to them and say, hey, it was the GRU. I mean, chances are you don't have the proof to say that, and that's something that I'm sure we're going to discuss. But um, moreover, it's not useful. What is GE going to do? Be beyond having the face of whatever Alexei or Dimitri on their board that they can, you know, throw darts at, you're not going to go and indict that person. Your chances are you're, you can't go rendition them out of Russia. Like, there's no, there's, for a private sector company, there's not much that they can do with that information. So, yes, it's very sexy, but we need to have a conversation about what the actionable value of that is and whether, as a third-party company, you should even be putting your name to that sort of thing and, and what use it will be. So then, if you're following along in the thought process from the side of the defenders and the threat intel producers, you start to have this kind of a conversation. You say, hey, this is causing too much trouble. We don't want to stop doing it. Obviously, there's a value to producing threat intelligence. But stop publishing. Stop making this a PR run. Let's have a conversation about what your release distribution cycle should be. Is it going to be to specific people? Is it going to be to customers? If it's to customers, then well, you can start making a profit. Great. Start selling your stuff, um, which also means, obviously, you can't give it away for free if you're going to sell it, but also uh, you can choose your customers and they're going to have to sign an NDA, which is wonderful. The one way to get away with selling something absolutely worthless is to put it behind an NDA. That's not to say that the threat intel is worthless in most cases. But it is to say, if I sell you something and you can't tell your friends whether it was any good, I can get away with selling it to as many people as I want. Rumors might go around, but you're not going to have a full report saying, hey, we bought so-and-so's product and it sucks. So that's kind of cool. But that's where we get into the issue that I did not get to cover. And it, you know, it was at, a, it was a, at an AV industry conference. So of course, we don't necessarily care to discuss validation. We care, as researchers, we sit around and go, hey, you saw so-and-so's report, that stuff sucked. I can't believe what they did. They made all these mistakes. They, you know, I can't believe how much press coverage they got for it, but you know, it was all wrong. And we can attempt to correct each other and we throw stones at each other over Twitter and you know, we, we say, hey, your threat intel no good, my threat intel better. Um, but when we start to talk about everybody receding into the shadows and dealing with one another behind NDAs and dealing with customers directly. You have to understand what the nature of a threat intelligence customer is. It's somebody with some money, some maturity about their network defense requirements, but almost certainly no in-house talent for threat intel, which means almost certainly nobody that can validate the value of what they've received. The alternative is somebody with more money than sense who just buys all the threat intel that they can, and then it's so much that they just automate its ingestion. So they're also not validating what they're getting. You get a giant feed of IOCs, pipe them into whatever system is going to do the detection for you, and you sit back. As long as nothing breaks, as long as you know, Gmail doesn't stop working for the executives, then you don't do anything about it. So who's going to validate the value of threat intel? And why is that important? Because at some point, if we all do this, you're going to get into a situation where somebody's going to be sold some snake oil, and they're finally going to get pissed enough to start dropping threat intel providers. And for a nascent industry, it is a big issue, because it's very easy to make the hop from your threat intel sucks to all threat intel sucks, and we don't need this. This didn't exist eight years ago. Why the hell should we be paying 80, 100, 200, 300, 500,000 dollars a year for your threat intel when it's not useful? Or we can't prove its use? Or it's causing more problems, false positives, and so on that, than, than what we had before. So why are we paying to have issues? So you're going to get into this validation crisis that very quickly becomes a trust issue within the industry. It could very quickly tank it. And I think that it's something that we shouldn't allow. There is a great value to understanding what the apex predators are doing on the internet. There's a great value to tracking what the biggest exploit producers and consumers are doing with those exploits. Uh, but there isn't necessarily a market dynamic that will ensure that those companies can, can keep doing what they're doing. So there's something to, to essentially attempt to fix there. And I think that 
a, a third player needs to enter the game. We need to have a whole different kind of entity get involved. One whose business is validation. One whose business is not necessarily in the pure production, but one that can be resorted to to say, hey, we're buying every Threat Intel feed, or we're only buying this one feed. Is it any good? Hey, we have an incident response engagement that is actually being, uh, that, that's going to be co-opted and used for a, a court case or for a political decision, as what we saw over the past six months. Can you at least validate the value of this product? Can you tell us if this research is true, legit, accurate? There is nobody that you can go to for that right now that isn't a direct competitor. I mean, let's discuss that. If, if you know, so-and-so says, here's a CrowdStrike report and then brings it to me as a Kaspersky employee or, or, or brings it to Symantec or so on, in good faith, I can look at it and say, hey, it's good. But there's nothing keeping me from saying, oh, it's, it's nonsense, buy mine instead. I don't think we do that right now, but you have to admit that it's still just a kind of good faith effort. So I think that we could discuss three different configurations that you know, I, I thought of as possibilities of what this entity could be. I don't pretend to be the oracle of threat intelligence. I don't know what this might look like, but these are some of the more uh, likely configurations. The first one that I could think of is one of delegated authority. This is the kind of thing that we usually see with security products, where you get another third-party validator who comes up and says, I tested every antivirus for you, and this one, the one that paid me last, is good. I think it's the weakest. I think it's the most likely to be corrupted. It's the most easy to get co-opted. As in, you know, tomorrow I can start a website that's called threatintelvalidation.com and I take money from every Threat Intel uh, player and the one who, told me, who refused to pay me is the one that has the shittiest Threat Intel. Forgive me. Um, it's not very good. And you also get into inconsistent methodology issues, which is something that we see with the testing of security products in general. The second one is what I call systematic intelligence escrow. And those are, you know, that's a fancy way of talking about intel sharing. That's an idea that everybody talks about at conferences, uh, especially, forgive me, academics tend to be very fond of the notion of why don't we all just get along and share our threat intel together? It's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. If, if, if I generate revenue from my visibility, and the fact that my visibility is not your visibility, I'm not going to give you my visibility. Simple as that. It's wonderful to have a shared mission, um, but at the end of the day, there's another distinction that you need to add in there, which is we're not just talking about piping raw information. We're talking about indicators of compromise and things that have been studied by human beings and automated systems and have, you know, there, there's a there's something turning data into information that is somehow valuable, and you're not just gonna give that away. Now, that said, sure, the idea is we could all put all of our indicators together into some escrow system. Maybe it's you know, cryptographically assured to not be, you know, to be one way accessible, and the idea is that when somebody sells you a report, you take all your indicators and you dump them into this thing, and it tells you, hey, you're only seeing a third of the picture, or you're seeing every single SOFA C indicator ever. Good for you, you got a good report. I think it also falls into another fallacy, which is this is not just about breadth of coverage. We don't want every single potential indicator. We don't want to essentially say, because company A sees uh, 300 indicators, then company B has to see 300 indicators because maybe half of those indicators are crap or maybe they're no longer being used. So it isn't just about coverage, it isn't just about numbers, so an automated system of escrow isn't going to validate this for you. So what is the more likely or the more desirable configuration? Independent verification. I mean, it's the most obvious configuration in, in a lot of ways to say, hey, we need to be able to go to a third party and say, hey, we'll pay you to redo this investigation, here's some of the visibility that they gave us, or here's none of what they gave us, just some of the original incident materials, investigate this for us and see if we're gonna get to the same place. I think that's obvious. However, it's not obvious for the market for a variety of reasons that we're going to discuss, including how labor intensive it is, the issues of availability, but more importantly, the fact that all the talent is in the private sector working in companies that are in direct contention with one another. There is no public sector equivalent. And for now, and having had a similar conversation in private, not as a presentation, uh, with Oxford and King's and a few other 
very legitimate universities. I don't think that there's an academic equivalent just yet. So that's what we're going to discuss from this point forward that I think is directly relevant to you and where you are. So that's the configuration that we might want. I think that academia can play a role here and an important role. One that has certain requirements we have not met and might not be easy to meet right off the bat. One that has certain potential benefits and one that has certain potential drawbacks, of course. Let's, let's talk about the full picture uh, before I try to sell you anything. So first of all, the requirements. What do we need? We need a team with specialized talent. Maybe it's grad students, maybe it's researchers, maybe it's professors, maybe most likely it's a combination of all of them. The truth is that you know what student churn is like, especially when it comes to specialized talent, chances are they're not gonna stick around. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. So it would be great to have a proper threat intel curriculum that is producing students that have some you know, standard level of skill. That's not simple. That isn't something that is around right now. And I, I'm not gonna judge what your curriculum looks like because I've never seen it, but I can at least tell you that having discussed this with a lot of other universities, computer science isn't producing threat intel guys. IR isn't producing threat intel guys. So chances are no one's producing threat intel guys. That is a possibility. Most of the people in my industry have never graduated college. Some of them are PhDs in physics. I'm a philosophy student. We're not coming out of some threat intel factory, which is a shame because it means that there is no threat intel factory. And you're gonna need a threat intel factory if you want to have people with these sorts of skills to consistently draw from. So it would be great for us to start to establish some kind of shared curriculum that we can all adopt in one way or another or at least start to produce what are probably already um, met requirements within a big, well-established university like this one, but that aren't being put together in the right way to actually have a curriculum. You also want to have an academic community because, forgive me, but sometimes we are litigious as an industry. You know, if you come out and say, hey, so-and-so's product sucks, so-and-so's lawyers are gonna be at your door fairly soon. So it would be great to have an academic you know, community uh, to, to provide a certain level of validation and protection uh, but also in order to, to start to bring the academic sector closer to what threat intelligence is like in practice. Again, forgive me, I've not come to your home to insult academics in any way whatsoever, uh, but looking at academic papers, it does feel like there's a very, very big gap or divide between the things we're talking about. Either because they're overly theoretical on the academic side or because there isn't enough information to draw from on the academic side, but a lot of times it just feels like we're not talking about the same thing. And it's made it very easy for people in my industry whom often have not graduated college to write off academia as a whole. Why do we need to talk to professors? Why do we need to talk to academics? Why do we need to talk to any of these research centers? Who cares? All they want is free stuff. They never buy anything from us. They never bring us any cool stuff. Don't talk to them. I'm not saying they're right but it is a perception issue that is often fed by, you know, going to Usenix conference where you go, hey, uh, we're creating a new decompiler. It's gonna be amazing, but we're gonna need five to six years to develop it. Guys, come on, like we hack tools together in six months, like we need it, just produce it, like put something out there, even if it's broken, it doesn't have to be perfect, it doesn't have to be your PhD thesis, just give us something, you know, we, we need to at least be working with each other in some way. So. Again, not putting academia down, just saying right now we're not necessarily playing on the same field. Um, and another thing to discuss is if you're gonna provide this service, we're gonna need to be able to have a certain level of availability on demand. I don't know if that, you know, that is essentially built on the idea of having a lot of these other things, but you're, you're gonna be able, you're gonna need to be able to respond um, in a lot of ways. So those are the requirements. To plunge us further into depths of despair, there are potential drawbacks. Of course, your research product is gonna be politicized. Sorry. There will be talent poaching. If right now any of your students came up to me and told me they're very good reverse engineers, chances are I would try to offer them a job. There's not a whole lot of people doing reverse engineering and malware analysis at any decent level out there. There's enough work to go around. So. I won't tell you the number of job offers that I get in a year, but we're all fighting for talent. 
So chances are, if you start to produce talent, people are going to offer them jobs. That's not necessarily a bad thing if we can find a different way to kind of keep things going. Like, I don't know what the cert is like here, but if you can have people that work on an advisory capacity, work on a consulting capacity, work full time somewhere else, but also uh, somehow contribute to your university efforts, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, that also ties into the next thing. The initial training will most likely not come from your professors. If we put together a good curriculum, and you have a university like CMU that has a very good computer science department, engineering department, and also has a very good political science and international relations department, chances are you've got most of the things you need, but you are probably gonna need to engage with a lot of real researchers who are gonna come in and say, this is how we do it, this is what we like to do, these are some of the things we need, these are some of the things we're missing. So that needs to challenge the notion that usually happens at universities where you go, the only people who can teach are tenured professors or people with PhDs or the kind of people that we consider authoritative. And I can understand why you do, but in a new industry that is born out of the black magic that is cracking software back in the Soviet days, I don't think that we can give ourselves the luxury of turning away experts. I think that we should be embracing them as fully as we can when they're willing to give up their time, even though it doesn't change anything. Like, I've been considering doing a PhD at King's. I'm, I'm a big fan of Tom Ridd, and you know, we, we tend to work together. Um, I've been considering doing a PhD at King's. If I take my time to go do a PhD, it's not gonna add a dime to my salary. It's only gonna be a drawback to my time and commitments. I would do it out of fun, and because I, you know, I'm a frustrated academic. But you have to keep that in mind when it comes to cooperation with other people in the industry. They don't necessarily have an incentive to do this other than caring about the, you know, the university, the environment, the future of the industry, and so on. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, and then, you know, you've got to balance things out between support and selling out. It'd be very easy for a big company to come in and say, hey, we've got $5 million for you, but you only research this and that. That happens a lot, uh, not just here. Uh, and uh, potential government pressures, hey, you rely on a whole lot of contracts from government X, Y, and Z. Uh, of course, we don't want you messing with this type of operation. I don't think it'll come down to that. I really don't. I'm, I'm not quite that tinfoil hatty about this sort of thing, but it's something to keep in mind. And then targeting. You guys, I gotta not use that language. Academics as a whole um, are actually not in a great place when it comes to information security because the people that are servicing your environments don't necessarily have great budgets. They don't necessarily get to be very competitive. They don't necessarily get to buy threat intelligence. They don't necessarily get to be cutting edge. It's not any fault of yours in particular, but just the way that that money gets appropriated and used. Um, and the idea that you don't necessarily have a stake in protecting the information that goes through your networks, short of maybe if you're doing some kind of advancements in, I don't know, chemicals or things that can actually be sold or might be done in cooperation with the government or private sector, chances are you don't care to protect what's going in on uh, around your networks. But if you start to do threat intel, just the way that we're targeted by really, really big players, you're gonna be targeted by really, really big players and you don't necessarily have an infrastructure that's protecting you. So that's the final drawback that I wanted to put in there. Now, there are good things, there are silver linings, there are benefits to discuss. There is a need for a lasting curriculum and this would be just the thing to push us into actually training people to do uh, not just a vocation but a very interesting bit of um, conceptual history, investigation, uh, and, and international relations space in a whole new domain of, I hate the term warfare, I don't think it applies perfectly, but at least a domain of operations that is currently not being observed to the level that it should. Uh, it, it would be a potential source of income for your research departments. I'm sure that you could get some extra uh, chump change from there. Uh, there is a promise of gainful employment for all of your graduates. I know people who are not even technical, who are getting away with taking a few threat intel classes and just the few spaces that have them, they get jobs. So it's something to discuss. I mean, they could be better, and I wish that they were, and they would be paid better if they were better trained, but it's something to, to keep in mind. And then this is a pet peeve of mine. We are essentially the only entity, uh, and I mean as threat intel researchers. We're the only entity that is documenting the early operations that are happening in cyber espionage and cyber warfare, if you like that term, uh, between countries for something like the past 15 to 20 years. All of that information is going away. 
The internet will not look the same. Sometimes it doesn't look the same from five years ago. Those resources are gone. Any information that was produced by a private sector product and never published is gone. Any information that a researcher discovered, came up with, or weighed into their decision-making process but didn't document or didn't publicly publish is gone. Ten years from now, if somebody goes, hey, I want to understand what happened back in the day of equation when, you know, uh, when whatever entity first started, the dawn of cyber espionage, that's gone. There is no recreating that investigation. There is no recreating how, you know, Turkey suddenly took up cyber espionage. There is no recreating how the United States and Russia and so on might have fought each other at the dawn of, of CNE. And that's really sad from the perspective of historians, uh, but also it's something that doesn't need to happen if we can start to get into this level of production and get into this place where we can save some of this information and give it the appropriate treatment and hopefully breach past just cyber and say, okay, we see operations between two different entities in Turkey and we can match this along with geopolitical uh, tensions and things that were happening at the time. We can match this with information that was released from archival documents. We can match this from information that was released from FOIA and so on. That work is not being done. The only project like that that I can think of is what we just did with Moonlight Maze and it was our cooperation between Kaspersky, well me, uh, Kostin Ryu, who some of you know, and, uh, and Thomas Ridd and Daniel Moore of King's College. And it was because you know, we were willing to kind of bridge the gap and work together and, and it took us nine months uh, to put this thing together. It was amazing work, but it's the only instance that I can think of where somebody said, hey, maybe it's worth it to FOIA request, reverse engineer, add, you know, thread until forward and back. Excuse me, but I think that effort was predated by the cooperation between Kaspersky and Levente Butian in Budapest. Well. Yes, you're right. So at least I can still give our company credit. Uh, Duku 2. Yes, at least, at least I can give our company credit. But yes, on, on Duku 2, we did uh, quite a bit of work together. I'll, I'll say that it's just marginally different because there were no documents for us to pick up. So you can't you know, go and, and, and FOIA whomever for Duku 2 information, but you're completely right. And it was fant it's fantastic to be able to get um, the academic sector involved in any way, even for the sake of validation. There are times when we have to come up with, such, with findings that seem so outlandish. We're not trying to scoop each other. We sit around going, hey, Symantec, hey, so do you guys want to publish on this as well? Do you have anything? Could you please publish at the same time so that we don't get a peanut gallery full of angry people uh, throwing rocks at us saying that's not possible? Um, this is a very different industry. So, and again, I think that there's a role to be played in just keeping vital research honest. So I've actually, I hope to shoot for an hour tops and then we could have some questions. So I'm gonna run through this very, very quickly. But there's a, there's a need to fill the validation vacuum. And I think that you guys know exactly why there's a need to fill the validation vacuum because of what just happened over the past year, because of what just happened with the election and all the madness and, and overly politicized um, version of, of threat intel that just went along. I am genuinely a bit ashamed at our performance over the past six months. And I mean that for the threat intel space as a whole because we were so flaky when the spotlight shone on us as an industry. You know, nobody cared about what we did before and all of a sudden everybody cares about what we're doing and they're saying, hey, okay, so what happened? And then we all just kind of looked at each other and we said, you know, how do we say this? What should we say? Do we want to talk about this? Oh, you know, the research methods will not allow me to... And we all kind of just fell apart and then you start getting nonsense like this. Oh, well, you know, no one knows who broke into the DNC. Well, yeah, yeah, but WikiLeaks is saying this and that. Uh, yeah, but it's actually kind of impossible to know whether the DNC guys were really from here or from there. And Oh, that other applications that are Trojanized by this APT group, oh, it probably never happened. And that just everything started to kind of fall apart. And let's be perfectly honest, I don't do attribution for reasons that I are very well detailed in a paper that got published about nine months ago, and you're all more than welcome to read. Just technically... We're not in a place where we can legitimately say, hey, it was institution A that was involved in that. However, clustering of, of, of this sort of activity is perfectly legitimate, and you can say this threat actor is involved in this intrusion, that intrusion, and that one. That's not in doubt. If you want to make the claim that this threat actor perfectly maps onto 
the GRU or the CIA or whomever, I think you're going way beyond your breach. There are too many configurations involved. It could be a mercenary group that they pay. It could be a defense contractor that they pay. It could be um, patriotic hackers, as they like to call them. Or, you know, it could be what happened with the cuckoo's egg back in the 1980s, the Cliff Stoll's story, where the Stasi were paying, you know, hackers with cocaine and money, and then they would take that information and give it to the FSB. Right. Exactly. But again, you know, you get into these situations where if I'm just looking at the research, if I'm just looking at what Cliff Stoll saw, and then I say it's the KGB, that's not an accurate statement. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it was interesting to see that that information was being used to then uh, fuel human sources that were attempting to steal information from the KGB as well. So. We can stop that kind of nonsense. While we're at that, and sorry to drive the line on this, but even my driver from the airport to here wanted to have a conversation about what happened with these guys. There's a false parody of expertise. There's this idea that as long as you can find one voice that will say that's not right or that's not true or that's not that we believe, then there's dissent within the industry. And there are experts on both sides. So. So if we're going to keep track, then, you know, you've got people that maybe you don't trust because they're part of the intelligence agencies, but I don't happen to have any contention with their expertise. I think they're brilliant. Uh, you've got companies like ourselves and CrowdStrike, Fidelis. This is the only time you're going to see other company logos in one of my presentations. <laughs> you've got the Donut, GCHQ. They do fantastic things. You've got Threat Connect, who I kind of trash, but they also do good work. Uh, and Mandiant, of course. And that's your tally on the yes column. And that's... Let me, let me parse terms a little bit. That's not to say, yes, they are from wherever, but yes, it is that threat actor. There is no doubt that it was APT28, Fancy Bear, Sednit, Sophacy, uh, SAR team, there's a billion names for these guys, same threat actor. There's no doubt that it was that, except in the DNC there was also another group on top of that, but that's not to say it wasn't these guys. Then on the other column, you've got Jeffrey Carr. That's it. That is it. And this is the same man who, I, don't, I shouldn't trash him because I'm in a public forum, but this person tends to have a nay opinion on almost every hacking operation or report that gets put out there. That's all I'm going to say. It's one expert. Expert. One guy who wrote a book. Isn't necessarily tuned into the visibility and the information that other companies have. Against the entirety of the intelligence community and the private sector who are all perfectly clear on what threat actor was involved in this operation. They're not all perfectly clear on what institution or what country, but we can say that there's a threat actor active since 2008 that was involved in these intrusions. So I think it's it, just for the sake of threat intel as a valid industry, we need to at least set the record straight. And then beyond that, beyond personal attacks or anything of the sort, I also think that we're being hit with an onslaught of misdirection and there are people that are laughing at us. Uh, Fancy Bear is the name that CrowdStrike gives APT28. APT28 has started to register accounts with the name Fancy Bear just to make fun of us, and make fun of the industry. This is the Fancy Bear's hacking team Twitter account, that's fancybears.net. Uh, in case you have any doubt that it's, a, you know, it's not a joke or anything of the sort, they actually started putting out information they stole on fancybears.net from WADA and like, uh, you know, anti-doping agencies and so on. And this similar thing happened with Gucci for 2.0, which is too long to get into now. But the idea is they're aware of our tactics, they're aware of what we do, and they're more than happy to misdirect and manipulate us. And the one thing that, you know, is missing from that yes and no column is there was not a single university as far as I can tell, you're welcome to correct me, there was not a single independent research team that wasn't involved in the government or in the private sector that had absolutely any opinion, that had any well-resourced or, or research-worthy paper, statement, validation, or anything of the sort. And I don't think that that was because there were no academics that were interested in the subject. I think that also comes from a lack of resources in a certain way that we're prepared to come forward and say, yeah, we can at least validate that it's this threat actor. And it's not legitimate to say it's that institution, that it's, you know, this country. We can't go that far, but we can go far enough to say it's that threat actor. So I think there's a very, I hope that it's not too somber a note to leave things on, but I think that there's a very legitimate need for academics to step into the sector, 
to validate research, to put us in our place when we're wrong, and to help customers and consumers who right now are faced with an impossible situation of just forking over money uh, without necessarily knowing the value of what they're buying. So that's me shooting myself in the foot as a Threat Intel producer, and I hope that you know, it wasn't too cumbersome. And uh, Apparently, we still have time for questions. If you, know, you guys want to run out, that's fine as well. But thank you. <laughs> well, I'll tell you this, right now it's difficult to call threat intelligence a science in a lot of ways. I, I, I think part of it is uh, that we're not taking the time to document our methods. We're not taking the time to show how reproducible our research is, what we're basing our conclusions on. We also have ontological issues where we don't necessarily have a direct framework where we say, we name threat actors based on this, campaigns based on that, toolkits based on that. There's, there's not a methodology that is clearly set. That's not to say that there can't be one. But there are no academics involved. There aren't people who think in these terms usually involved right now. There's a few, but you know, when we get to kind of work together, there's still a sort of, uh, we don't necessarily validate the expertise of what the academic sector can bring to us. And we don't necessarily share what we could be giving to the academic sector. So it's a need to kind of fix the sphere as a whole. Um, and honestly, Beyond helping the methodology of threat intel specifically, I think that there's a lot of things that could be studied in what's happening in cyberspace right now that aren't, like the proliferation of zero days, the re-adoption of toolkits, what happens with open source malware, uh, what happen just how fast and how diversely things are spread from leaks. Like something that's happening now with the equation toolkit uh, happened when ha the hacking team toolkit got open sourced as well, which is what happens when cyber criminals start to take these sorts of tools and start to leverage them. We caught an APT team leveraging hacking team zero days within two days. So you say, hey, this has been done for the well-being of the industry and for the well-being of privacy in the community. No, not really. This is being done and, and you know, people are getting, you know, random normal users of the internet are getting hit with ransomware using zero days that would have cost $500,000 because somebody decided to just throw it on the internet. So I hope that's kind of a tangential way of answering your question. How wide is the gap of trust between private tech and government? Why is it? No, how wide how is wide? the gap of trust between tech? Um, much wider from the mouth out than it is in reality. So it's a lot easier for the private sector researchers to go up to the government and say, hey, this is what we know. And it's a lot easier for the, for the government to come up to the private sector in private and say, hey, you guys might want to look at this. But if we have to come out and say it publicly, we're going to have issues. Like there was an, a, another case that would have fallen very similarly on that yes, no column was the Sony hack. There was so much contention out in the public about the Sony hack. And in reality, there wasn't much when it came to the actual research sphere. I mean, it was very clear that, you know, the sort of Lazarus cluster that had been active since I think 2007, 2008 was involved in the, the Sony hack. Um, the government said it. The private sector said it. We shared information behind the scenes seamlessly. But when it came to the stories, when it came to the reporting, when it came to the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and so on, everybody you know, had, these, uh, had this bickering to do. Uh, there are market forces that affect how things are presented publicly, but research, the research sector, thankfully, is not really affected by this. We have shared, we have information sharing groups, we have all kinds of structures involved, and, and honestly, this is such a small industry where having beers in DC is still where a lot of information gets shared between the two, and there's no contention there. So I think the wide is more of an appearance. The, the, the gap is more of an appearance than it is anything else. You mentioned a lot of ethical dilemmas, and I'm assuming one might be, you kind of alluded to the fact that you might run into potentially a government intelligence agency doing a certain type of operation. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I'm not sure where you're based, but in terms of how allegiance um, align and whether you ever feel compelled to then go inform the government that's being targeted? Um, so I'm based in Miami. I'm a U.S. citizen. Not that anybody considers me that when they see me, uh, <laughs> including TSA. 
Uh, that said, uh, I'm in one of the few threat intel research teams that has no compunction about researching every single threat that we can find. Uh, I think that there's a value to doing that, and I, I've been trying to kind of proselytize the, the idea that more companies should be doing this, not out of uh, trying to put the U.S. or my home base in a disadvantageous position or anything of the sort, but I think that we need to be a little more rigorous in what we do, specifically because there are situations that are unforeseeable that we need to be prepared for. For example, I'm sure that a lot of companies would have refused to do research into the equation team. Nobody published on Equation Team after we did or when we did, ever. It, it, was, it was 2004, 2014, nobody researched Equation Team publicly after that. Then Equation Team tools are open sourced. What happens, let's say, let's say a breach happens, somebody takes the Equation Toolkit, and there's six months before that breach is publicized. Had somebody seen an incident three months in, and told the institution involved, not the public, that would have been a sign for them that there had been a breach. The lack of willingness to just investigate the thing, I think it, it, it's just a fantastic way to get blindsided. Now, answering your question more directly, which I wasn't, I wasn't trying to avoid, uh, there's a lot of pressures. Usually, I don't think that we feel that much um, not many issues when it comes to the United States in particular. I think that sort of the first world in general has rules that they abide by, and there's no reason to be quite so contentious with the intelligence community here at all, which tends to do a lot of information sharing and tends to be very good about that sort of thing. I think we have bigger issues when you get into uh, perhaps slightly more brutal countries that you might be investigating, and uh, there are places I won't travel to at this point. I'll say that. Uh, but it, it isn't so much mistrust for my home country. It's more about getting in the way of uh, criminal activities or getting in the way of what to us are ethically illegitimate operations, but to them are perfectly valid legal operations. And I just won't be going to certain places anytime soon. And so, for example, I think I will name them, but we can all surmise what those more brutal countries are. So if you were to find them actively targeting a certain sector within the U.S., et cetera, um, would you then identify like those institutions targeted and then also the, like, the U.S. government, or would, would that be Kaspersky's judgment versus you no, being I mean, able to do that? I think we're, we're very free about sharing that kind of information. Um, I think it's perfectly legitimate to come up to a customer if you can identify them. So that's not always a given. So one way is if we get to sinkhole domains, then you can see active victims. That's very easy. Uh, but sometimes you just get a bunch of IPs, half of them are home-based IPs. Like I've got a victim of a hangover operation in France that has been beaconing to us like consistently for the past nine months, and it's just a home ISP. So you contact you know, French intelligence or the French government and you say, hey, there's this there. Maybe they'll want to look into it and maybe they won't. And that's about as much as you can do as an institution. But if you can identify who it is, sure, I mean, fantastic. Go to them, half the time, um, they won't answer the phone. 30% of the time, the IT guy thinks he's going to lose his job, so he'll like try to misdirect you, hang up, whatever. And then 20% of the time, you get lucky, and they go, oh, great, you know, what can we do? Uh, I think it's really important for threat intel teams to do those engagements, hopefully pro bono, and not even, like, I think there's some extortion scheme, schemes I don't like. I think at that point, you should just say, hey, you know, we'll help you what we can, here's the information, and good luck. You know? It depends on the company. I think there was some question over here, and I may have ignored somebody. Anybody? Oh. Okay. Anonymous, it stays, but mm -hmm. have you given any thought to maybe ways that you could sanitize data so it's actionable but not attributable and then kind of prep it for wider <coughs> release? Uh, yes and no. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, I haven't. So we're, we're talking about... Uh, the ability to sanitize and anonymize data so that it can be shared to people um, without necessarily being identifiable where it's coming from or, or who it's targeting. Uh, yes and no. So you get into a situation where you can provide indicators of compromise and they can be relatively anonymized. Like you can say, you know, you won't know who the victims are. That seems okay. But it's not the full weight of threat intelligence when, it's, when there's no context involved. 
So the bigger issue that you get into is, it's not so much whether I can give you the IOCs. I can give them to you half the time. Or I can give you YARA rules, probably. But how valuable is it to you without necessarily knowing the tools, techniques, and procedures of the threat actor involved? So then all of a sudden, I've got to give you all this context that involves, you know, how do you know that they're that they were involved in these other hacks? And how do you know who, what kind of verticals they may have been hitting before? And how do you know that, you know, they're often Russian-speaking developers? Oh, sometimes there's Cyrillic in it. Oh, sometimes they use Russian ISP, sometimes they don't. And you start to get into that situation where you just rebuild the entire threat intel package. Um, and the issue there isn't so much the, you know, de anonymizing victims or burning victims in particular, it tends to just be describing the threat actor at all. Like just coming out and saying, hey, this is probably a series of Romanian developers and we've seen them active for five years and this is the ISPs that they use and this is their toolkit and so on. You're going to piss somebody off. Maybe it's somebody you don't care about. Sometimes it's somebody you do care about or that you should care about. It's, it's a complicated situation. It's important to kind of put that information out there. I'm a little sad that we're not publishing as much as we are, mostly because I like writing papers for public interest that tend to rely on these cases, and now I can't substantiate them half the time. Uh, but it's a complicated market dynamic. Anybody? Am I getting away with no election hack questions? This is fantastic. Yeah, hold it. Okay. Uh, so you, uh, you, you, you kind of described a couple different roles of the university. One, one was is basically providing a, a pipeline of qualified people, mm -hmm. and the other was actually doing Intel uh, research. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, what, what you think the, the sweet spot is for universities getting involved. Well, I wouldn't, uh, yeah, I wouldn't presume to prescribe exactly what universities should be doing. I think there's a lot of questions involved in that that I that involve X factors that I have no vision into. I, I don't know how long students usually stick around for. I don't know how you manage your budgets. I don't know uh, how much you care to get into this sort of thing. However, um, just the same as you have a cert that provides a, a certain value even to a, the country as a whole, I think this is a function that's not too far away from that. The notion that you can investigate uh, cyber espionage operations, whether they're just inbound, whether they're just against the United States, whether they're against other academic institutions or whatever, um, I would be happy to see any test case arise. Like, even if it's just a matter of saying, hey, there's nobody defending academic institutions. Why don't we start to create some threat intel teams that are just focused on doing pro bono work for other academic institutions and we share our visibility as academic institutions within a single country and uh, we start to generate some threat intelligence. I mean, that is a need. None of us are serving it. And, uh, and it's something that you could generate a, an ecosystem with a whole lot of tangential benefits while having a, a very legitimate case for both the data and the product that you're going to create. I think that you could find a lot of talented people that will be more than happy to come and help set that up. Uh, but the bigger thrust has to come from a sort of mental flexibility and availability of human resources on the academic side more than anything else. But yeah, I won't tell you how much of it you should do. It's up to you guys. <laughs> I'd be happy to see a lot of it. If you could actually set up an institution like the CERT that is going to live through and through, I don't think the need for malware analysis and threat intelligence is going to go anywhere. But that's just me. Yeah. So you're... <coughs> Your comments earlier about, uh, or your description of, of how things changed in 2015 and a lot of uh, public reporting has now gone behind a paywall, essentially. Um, in the meantime, uh, a lot of effort has been put into increasing information sharing and automated indicator, sh indicator sharing and all mm -hmm. sorts of programs in public and private partnerships and all that, yeah. all that sort of thing. Um, does that, do you think that has a future? Or do you, do you think it do, is like, is the... Is the attractive state here, you know, everything's behind a paywall and paying for it means that you've got skin in the game and, and, and an interest in keeping things private because I think, you know, public, the public sharing has a, has a problem regardless of whether it's in threat in, I mean, it all becomes threat intel at some point, right? In theory. So, um, yeah, I think there's two big questions there, which is one, the, the future and, and value of public sharing and what's happening with those programs and then 
um, the future of threat intelligence paid for service. And I'll, you know, I'm happy to go through both of them. As far as the public sharing stuff, I don't think it all eventually becomes threat intelligence. I don't think that there are that many people that actually produce threat intelligence very effectively. That's not to toot my own horn, it's actually a problem, a deficiency with the industry. We have very few well-trained people, we have very few people that specialize in this in particular. It kind of sucks. There's so much work, like we're tracking something like 110 advanced threat actors in any given moment. There's 40 of us in the team, not, every, not even half of us specialize in cyber espionage. There's only so much you can do. And so a lot of indicators and visibility are coming through, a lot of data is coming through. It's not necessarily being coalesced or turned into a product. It's not necessarily being shared to where it should be. So that's one side of it. I don't think that the public sharing stuff actually has as much gold as people think that it does. It almost always is a just barrage of data that nobody knows what to do with. And then somebody will try to organize it into an automated system, and then hopefully it gets tossed into uh, some detection system that, if you're lucky, doesn't turn up a ton of false positives. And that's it. But I don't think that that's the same as somebody taking the time to say, hey, what campaigns are in here? What threat actors are involved? Where are they going? What is beyond our actual data that can still be seen? So, you know, you start with a lead, and then hopefully virus total and a lot of other public sources will give you more. Uh, I don't think that kind of digging is being done on a lot of that public sharing stuff. It's not to say it's invalid. I just think that it isn't equivalent. Now, on the side of threat intelligence as a paid-for service, I don't know what the future of it is. I'm not a big fan. I mean, I, I understand why the market wants it, and in part it pays my salary, so I'm, I'm not complaining about it. But I think that it doesn't necessarily serve the public good. Uh, it kind of just puts a patch on a larger discussion that we need to have about, you know, protecting this sort of research, why it's of public interest, what we should be doing with it, and hopefully enabling um, research that goes beyond just cyber. Like I keep mentioning countries like Turkey or Russia or China or Singapore, Italy, a lot of countries with a ton of CNE and CNO talent um, that is very directly tied to their uh, international relations conflicts, geopolitical issues, uh, political corruption scandals, things that would make not just public interest discussions, but just general and investigative necessities. And they're ignored because there's this, this gap there. So I don't know what's going to happen in the future of the threat intel industry. Maybe the, for, the paid for stuff will always stick around. Maybe it'll be a fad for three more years. Maybe it'll become a compliance requirement. But uh, I, I have no idea. So. I mean, that's a really broad question. I'm glad you're letting me kind of wax lyrical, but uh, sure. Uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting because I've also got a bit of a background in, in dealing with the mayhem that is trying to integrate technological advancement into a less than developed country. Um, a lot of times it's a bit of a nightmare. Honestly, technological advancement, um, and I'm going to try not to get too continental so I don't see anybody kind of groaning about my actual philosophy background, but there's a rate of acceleration of adoption that just gets out of everybody's hands. Not only do you not have the talent, do you not have the budget, do you not have the overseeing prerogative to manage how technology is introduced into an institution whose main purpose isn't technological. Um, but also it all advances so far beyond your reach and capability so quickly that the normal reaction is just to let it happen. So people will bring their own devices, people will adopt their own software, people will choose what they want to do with it, whether they want to disable it, whether they want to enable it, whether they want to bypass it, whether they want to involve technology in things that we probably should never involve technology in. Um, and maybe not adopt technology and things that would be made extremely efficient by technology. So, look, I'm not a voting, electronic voting naysayer in all cases, but electronic voting in certain countries that don't have what it takes to regulate it isn't a good idea. It isn't. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about Ecuador half the time. Right now, they're trying to recount something like 1,500 election boxes just, I mean, thank God they have paper. 
I don't trust them to implement a cryptographically secure implementation of a voting system. It, technology has an allure uh, that I don't think we're ever going to get beyond. I don't think you can get people to not embrace convenience and not embrace ease. But cybersecurity is one of those open wounds that come along with technological adoption uh, that show us just how incapable we are in a lot of ways just how amazing it is that we have hacked together systems. Because they're literal hacks. Even, you know, I love Macs. I think they're the most polished products on the market right now. But even this is a series of hacks of a series of open source systems that even anybody, I'll be surprised if anybody within Apple has ever looked at all the components and all the software that goes into it. So then, you know, it's in the nature of... Um, of Turing machines, it's in the nature of, of Turing completeness that you create these things that can do everything. Then the problem is they're subject to human intentionality and you say, hey, today I want to use this for good, tomorrow I want to use this for evil. You know, cooking knife is a stabbing knife depending on who you give it to and what day. And then we try to patch that by saying, fine, we're going to create a sentinel. We're going to create a piece of software that's watching what's happening on the system and can tell whether something is good or bad. And that's what antivirus is. That's what anti-malware becomes. Um, and the, the more successful it is, or the more silent the attacker becomes, the easier it is for us to go, hey, maybe we don't need it at all. And that's not me trying to maintain job security. But I find it kind of ridiculous that we're having so many arguments with exploit developers, people at Google, people at different research teams were saying, anti-malware is the worst thing you can put on your computer. Okay, take it off. And don't just take it off the computer of somebody who is one of the most elite exploit developers on the planet. Take it off of your grandmother's computer and let her browse for three months and then come by for Thanksgiving and see how well that's doing. So, you know... It, no security solution is ever going to be perfect, especially when you include all possible threat scenarios and use cases within the thing that you need to protect against. We're really good against ransomware. We're really good against banking trojans. We're good against file infectors, worms, viruses. They don't work anymore. The things that used to work five years ago sometimes don't work, generally don't work. Some of them do. But... If you compare side by side to Linux, where there's almost no endpoint protection, everybody loves Linux. Everybody who thinks that they're really good at computers loves Linux because they think that they have complete control. They have complete control over the setup of it, so obviously they have complete control over the functioning of it. But that's not true. Just because you can set a system up to be custom-made, bespoke, tailored to what you think is good, doesn't mean you can keep that system from running things that can pass themselves off for you. So I recently did a bit of research into uh, Moonlight Maze, which is a 20-year-old attack. It's the oldest publicly acknowledged cyber espionage campaign. We were able to unearth artifacts from Moonlight Maze, which in itself was a miracle. But then we found something really interesting. The Moonlight Maze guys really love this open source backdoor called Loki 2 that was released in Frack Magazine 1996-1997. You can go download the source code right now. And they started to implement it more and more in all these samples that we see from 1997, 1998, 1999, and then our visibility ends. If you look at modern day Turla, which is another Russian speaking threat actor, at some point in 2014, uh, Great discovers a uh, Linux backdoor that we called Penguin Turla. If you look at Penguin Turla, it is also based on Loki 2. And we started to kind of tie these connections when we realized that the source code, the base, the code base for Penguin Turla was actually developed sometime between 1999 and 2004. So where our visibility into Moonlight Maze ends is when the Tur Penguin Turla code base begins. What's unbelievable about that is to consider that source code that was written, maintained, and developed in 1999-2004 is being leveraged in attacks in 2011, 2014, 2016, 2017. And that's a really roundabout way of answering. That's a fantastic comparison between endpoint security on Linux and endpoint security on Windows. There is no way in hell you're going to get a 20-year-old virus to work on Windows. 
You can talk as much shit, forgive me, about Windows security. It sucks in a lot of ways, but you're not going to get a 20-year-old backdoor to run on Windows. Whereas there are current use cases and scenarios where a 20-year-old backdoor is functioning on Linux. And I think that that has to do with the fact that there has been no cat and mouse game between an endpoint security, anything, industry, community, whatever, and the maintainers of the operating system, the developers of security solutions, and so on. Technology is a fantastic thing. Nobody's ever going to stop us from adopting it further. But it has gotten so far out of hand that we have no consideration for ethical dilemmas. We have no consideration for uh, the diversity of people that we're trying to get to adopt technology and what it'll mean in their lives. Another fantastic example of that is how privacy-creating technologies in the first world are privacy-destroying technologies in the third world. It's not amoral. Technology doesn't... I mean that the same things that we use to monitor attacks, to limit um, visibility into attacks in the United States, are essentially the same principles that are used to limit the Internet uh, from functioning and limit accessibility in China. Something re that recently happened with Tor is... Um, before Tor was developed, this is notion of, you know, we're going to generate privacy by hiding any, everybody in this cloud, and you can't see how things are moving, which is a fantastic way of, of hiding in noise. As of, I think, about a year ago, Tor's in, intended mission changed to the notion that this is a privacy tool for activists and people working in sort of denied areas and so on. By changing that statement, alone, you have imperiled every single Tor user in a dictatorial regime in the rest of the planet. Technologies aren't acontextual. They don't just have a kind of morally whitewashed scent to them. And we'd like to think that way, the same way that we as anti-malware developers would like to think that way, because it, you know, takes away our responsibility when we accidentally or tangentially or unintentionally block the visibility of a nation state into a terrorist cell or a ring of pedophiliacs because uh, it was also the same malware that they were using to target academics and target, uh, you know, Angela Merkel's aid. But that's our only choice. So it's easier to not tackle the ethical dilemma every day by just coming up with a reduction. Like, it's malware, we block it. Sure. But it's not that simple. I have one more question. Sure. So you mentioned your background in philosophy. You also mentioned like the dire need for reverse engineering. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the general skill set that is required to do threat intel in a, yeah. in a sufficient manner. Absolutely. So um, it's kind of funny. Um, a lot of the people that I know in threat intelligence don't come from overly technical backgrounds. Um, I think the biggest requirement is almost always a kind of problem-solving mentality. It's really fun. It's super interesting. Uh, nobody in the entire industry has all the skills required to tackle every single problem. So, for example, I'm just starting to get good at reversing um, Intel x86 and x64 binaries, which is what almost all malware you're going to see. Then I get into this Moonlight Maze project. Everything is 20-year-old Spark, Assembly, and MIPS. Nobody writes that anymore. I was seven years old when the samples were developed. You just, you, welcome to a new problem, learn something new, develop some new tools, develop some new skills. So the whole point is you need to get into a kind of problem-solving mentality. Um, I would much prefer if I were given free reign to take a bunch of poli-sci and IR uh, students who have an interest in tech and train them to know the technical end of it um, than to take a bunch of overly specialized tech people and try to teach them geopolitics and international relations. That's not to take the hopes away from anybody, you know, almost certainly everybody here is, is probably in tech, uh, but it's just a lot harder uh, to broaden people's thinking sometimes. There's a role for everybody. There are people who are just brilliant reverse engineers who just don't want to have anything to do with the politics. Their analyses suck, but they're going to do amazing reverse engineering. Great. Do the, do the malware analysis. Now, another thing. Um, almost all the resources you have are available 
either from books you can buy, download, or tutorials you can download most of the time. A lot of the people who got really good at reverse engineering used to just crack software because they lived in Eastern Europe and, and Russia and they didn't have the money to pay for stuff and they just it was fun to, to crack protection schemes. Those same skills then all of a sudden became really valuable when you had to understand what a black box of software is trying to do. So you learn, okay, let me take that for a second. You learn things that you're not being taught in comp sci most of the time. Some comp sci departments happen to be really good and really thorough and think that you should understand how computers work no matter what. Most comp sci departments are, more, are just trying to show you new shiny tech that you want to be able to put on your curriculum and say, hey, I know PHP, I know Python, I know React, I know blah, blah, blah. Um, but the truth is that you, as far as reverse engineering is concerned and threat intel is concerned, what you need to know is almost certainly assembly and C, and memory management, and the fundamentals of operating systems, and things that are not being taught for the most part in computer science departments. Which is why half of the time getting a comp sci grad isn't really that valuable. At most they'll be um, employed for developing tools. Like they're gonna develop the databases that you're gonna use, and they're gonna develop some of the automated systems, but they're not gonna do the reverse engineering. So that's not to say it's a disability of people, it's just you're not honing in the skills that you need. And if you wanna be a full stack threat intel guy, you need to have a foot in that, and you need to have a foot in some semblance of geopolitics analysis, understanding of conventional intelligence, uh, understanding even of a little bit of game theory, a little bit of just behavioral psychology. You know, what makes people do what they do? Why does this look this way? Why are they moving in this direction? So it's super broad. You don't need to come in having all of that. Most companies are so used to the apprenticeship system, they're more than happy to hire somebody who's promising and just shove them into a group of people who know what they're doing and hope that you know they'll give you a year, year and a half where you kind of soak a lot of that in and then hopefully you become useful and hopefully you don't leave. <laughs> 18 months later, somebody comes to you and says, hey, we'll bump your salary by 50 grand and then people leave. So it, it's, it's a hard dynamic. But I think it's really valuable. I, honestly, I meet a lot of comp sci people who just really want to get into it, and, and I'll sit there and like design a little study guide, and it's like, okay, read this, do this, try this. You know, None of it is going to be, almost none of it is going to be taken on by, by your normal curriculum, and screw it. I mean, if you're disciplined, then I learn this stuff in my free time. So... Anybody on that inspiring note? <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you. On that subject.